Recently, I attended a screening of Paul Thomas Anderson's new film, Licorice Pizza. It was an excellent watch, transporting me to the 1970s, telling an endearing, slightly creepy to some, coming of age tale. And most importantly, gave me two plus hours of Alana Haim, my new celebrity crush. What I didn't expect going into Licorice Pizza was to learn a story of one boy's business venture of selling waterbeds. Waterbeds are an interesting breed of fad furniture. They were before my time, a mere nostalgic fascination that I really had no experience with. But this movie made me want to learn more. Before sitting down to research for this video, I had a conversation with my aunt and cousin about the nature of waterbeds. We tried to come up with a modern item we use that might one day hold the same retro status as waterbeds do now. It was hard to come up with anything, but eventually, in hindsight, I'm sure there will be something akin to a waterbed that will make the next generation curious. Anyways, let's examine the history of these things. A form of waterbed was invented in 1833 by the Scottish physician Neil Arnott. Dr. Arnott's hydrostatic bed was devised to prevent bed sores in patients and comprised a bath of water with a covering of rubber impregnated canvas on which lighter bedding was placed. But in 1969, the same year as Woodstock and the Beatles' last live performance, the modern waterbed was designed by a student of San Francisco State University, Charles Hall. The story goes it was for a class project, a weird ass class project, my guy, if you ask me. So yeah, uh, therapeutic flotation systems were experimented as early as the 19th century, but Hall is widely considered the inventor of the waterbed in its popular form. Before H2O, Hall originally turned to starch and jello as a filler, but the goo tended to swallow the sleeper. The right formula that Hall eventually came to was a vinyl bag filled with water that was fitted with a temperature control device and liner and set in a sturdy frame. Waterbeds caught on instantly and were common on many college campuses. An early reputation for leakage caused them to be outlawed by some campus housing authorities. A college graduate of the early 70s recalls a big scene on move-in day. Many hoses hung from the windows of incoming waterbed users. David Klein, inventor of Jelly Belly, apparently, said it was a counterculture item. It was different. It was not the bed your parents had. I definitely got this vibe about waterbeds as a kid. They seemed taboo. In the mid-1970s, stand-up comics and television sitcoms had a field day with waterbeds. In an episode of the sitcom Phyllis, for instance, Phyllis, played by Cloris Leachman, checked into a motel room only to discover a pink fur waterbed. She later accidentally stabbed it with a letter opener, creating a geyser that gushed to the ceiling. Such scenes created a profound image problem for the waterbed industry. The waterbed was frequently associated with sex, drugs, and rock and roll. 250 gallons of water and even more sexual promise. The organic, free-floating form of waterbeds seemed to capture the spirit of the age. The protagonist in Licorice Pizza, Gary, played by Cooper Hoffman, is sold on waterbeds because of the idea that it might catch the attention of gals. Okay, I just realized the New York Times article I'm referencing was published in 1986. <laughs> uh, I'll link it in the description of this video if anyone wants to check that out. The dead giveaway came when I read a professor of anthropology and folklore at Berkeley's quote. He remarked that, The country is in a different mood now than in the 1970s. There is a movement of conservatism. The family is coming back. There's a shift away from the self-indulgence of the 1970s. So this did not seem like a read of what's going on in 21. And now, given the state of affairs, I wouldn't be shocked if waterbeds made a huge comeback. So the counterculture peeps became more respectable and it was no longer jibing with them to go to work at a major corporation after a night's sleep on the old waterbed. But I'm sure a few hardcore waterbed fans held on. Rod Lauer, owner of November Waterbeds in Baltimore, one of the nation's oldest dealers, said, People kind of smile when you say the word waterbed. I know I do. Another downside to waterbeds was this. If the water inside is not treated with a chemical like Clorox, you could end up with a mattress full of algae. There was also the problem of having beds spring a leak. These issues caused waterbeds in general to fall out of popularity, as people weren't willing to take the risk of filling their homes with unwanted water. My aunt claims my dad once put a hole in one. And because we also brought this up in our conversation, 
There's just no way to safely get fish inside of your water bed without having to replace them every few days as they die off. Conclusion, the water bed never toppled Big Box Spring, but the invention remains a powerful symbol and a curious quirk of the 1970s. Thanks for watching.